Hello and welcome to the show. We've got a special edition this week of Whittle. Uh, I'm joined by our two senior fellows, Philip Kisley, Dr. Philip Kisley from Leeds University, and of course, Rafe Hadelman Koo, uh, historian and broadcaster. The reason that we're getting together this week is that we've just published our latest book. Here it is, State of Emergency, and it's a voice for the silenced majority. Um, there are a number of essays in this, but the point is, is the book is actually based around a series of pledges which we will be putting to candidates who are standing in the general election next year, whenever it happens. Um, and there are a series of essays which support these pledges. These are the things that we at the New Culture Forum think have to be done if this country is in fact to be saved. Mm. Now, I am so pleased that I'm joined by Philip and Rafe because one of the most important areas of course, is education. In fact, in some ways, you could say it's at the root of all of this. Um, so I'm going to discuss with them today because they've both written chapters in this book on education. Um, thank you very much for joining today. Um, I'm going to start, actually. These are these pledges, 10 of them, and there are two on education. And first of all, number four, we have we need the thorough, balanced history of Britain and its achievements being taught to every pupil in every school to the age of 16. Right? And then we also have, there must be uh, a complete ban on the teaching as though it were fact of critical race theory, gender ideology and other associated ideologies in schools across the entire curriculum. Uh, so, in other words, these are quite, you know, these are quite drastic measures, which, of course, will appeal, I'm sure, to everybody's common sense. But um, if I could start, first of all, with you, Rave, um, I think very few people will disagree with that. What is the state of play actually as it is now when it comes to the teaching of British history? Well, essentially, in this country, um, we have the lowest uh, age at which we can start to drop history as a course in this yeah. country. In many countries in Europe, it is the age of 16 or 15, uh, but it's easily possible to stop t learning history at the age of 14. And when you consider that from that age up to that age of 14, the variety of history education people are, are given covers things like ancient civilizations. The Incas, for example, could be discussed. Yeah. You could be looking at countries in Africa and their civilization, too. When you're studying history for such a short period of time, and when you are teaching such a wide variety of subjects, there's no time to actually learn mm -hmm. about the core elements of British history. Mm -hmm. And as the title is chaptered, a nation <clears throat> ignorant of history is like a man with, a, with no memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't be an active player in society if you're ignorant of history, if you don't know uh, how we came to be, if you don't know the story of our institutions and so forth, you can't really engage in any debate mm. or any discussion. And particularly now when we see our history constantly being uh, re re revised mm. and uh, attacks made upon it, people don't feel able to actually defend it. Worse still, of course, when they do get their history education, mm. they're getting a very slanted view of history. Mm. Uh, we now know, of course, that fewer than 10% of teachers vote for the conservative or centre-right parties. And it's increasingly the case that teachers are bringing their activist ideology and politics either directly or indirectly into the classroom. And so when, for example, you're teaching about the British history, which did bad things and good things, only the bad things are being taught, not the good yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, slavery is being taught in a negative context without actually fully celebrating the fact that Britain was the first empire in history to, to abolish this. And so as a result of that, we, ha we have got a population of, of youth today which are more radicalized than any other generation. They are more left-wing than any previous mm -hmm. generation. And I don't <clears> think <throat> people in this country, particularly the Conservative Party and others, fully understand the consequences of having such a radicalized generation because for the first time in history, mm -hmm. people under 25, under 35 actually, aren't becoming conservative as they grow older. Mm -hmm. It was always the case that the youth would be radically mm -hmm. left and then they would become more moderate as they grow older. We're not seeing that. And we therefore have the very real risk that in about three, three, de gener uh, three decades from now, two to three decades, the majority of this population, including those in positions of power, will be people who hold radically different views from the rest of society for centuries, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that means we're living in literally in revolutionary times, yes. epoch-defining, yeah. a dystopian mm -hmm. future. And it's so important, therefore, that we really teach 
the reasons for being proud of history and teach it in a chronological fashion because too much today mm. is taught in bits and bobs. People learn about the Tudors, mm. they learn about the Nazis, they may learn about the Victoria, and that's it. Mm. Uh, if we teach history as a, as, as in, a, in a terms of a timeline, people <coughs> can actually understand how things develop. Yes, it's, and the pyramids usually, isn't it? The Egyptians, mm. <laughs> they get sort of these kind of, uh, as you say, morsels. Um, Philip, you know, you're obviously uh, a lecturer in higher education at Leeds University. Uh, presumably, kids turn up there knowing very little about actually history. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, 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 that strikes me, I've looked in my chapter actually very specifically about gender ideology. Well, it's going to come to that. Yeah, yeah. And, the, um, and the secrecy surrounding it. Uh, and I've called the chapter Don't Tell Your Mum, mm. um, because that's essentially what's happening in schools. People... Um, uh, teachers, schools, the education establishment generally are are in a colluding, in a kind of conspiracy of silence. It's mm. it's really it's really shocking. But yes, I see um, students, eighteen year olds coming to uh, coming to university, having no idea whatsoever of any kind of grand narrative of history at all. Mm. Um, and what's worse, if they do learn history, Rafe's kind of uh, alluded to it. They they, they learn the bad bits and that's it. But they also learn themed history, which is black history, which is women's history, which is trans history. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. So we have these um, subjects which are just empty vessels. And inside them, we have all of this ideolo ideology, particularly critical race theory, but also gender ideology as well. You know, trans history, we've, we've seen it as well in, in the, the museums uh, and the heritage sector, where they are pushing trans history and, and, and queer histories. Mm. Nobody knew this stuff existed 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but in, in this book, so I get to, to address those, I mean, I do call, make some recommendations, mm. um, including the abolition of Black History Month, the abolition of Pride history yeah, month yeah. and actually the introduction of a british history week hmm. by which i mean everyone in the entire school every year will take part in a week where they celebrate a particular aspect of british history hmm. Hmm. they do their own projects at home to bring in and hmm. there's an actual celebration and there may be a school performance hmm. or something hmm. to actually teach those sorts of what things what else have you got there that you and actually that, well to make it a statutory requirement um to study the enlightenment and the age of reason the hmm. scientific revolution the industrial revolution the abolitionist movement in the slave trade, a balanced history of the British Empire, the horrors of communism and Nazism, rather than just focusing on Nazism, because increasingly we see communism rising uh, amongst the youth, um, and dropping the requirement to learn about non-European society, mm. uh, and instead of that, focusing on a, on a European society yeah, to provide yeah, context, yeah. because we, and then we, we stress here that we must remember we are part of a European civilization. Mm -hmm. So celebrating British history, but also how Britain plays into its wider European context. And also, um, you know, in, in, in engaging in allowing, for, for example, each of the nations to celebrate their National Saints Day, having that become part now mm -hmm. of, of the national curriculum. And also actually citizenship classes, which I think also need to be, in addition to history, teaching people the importance of fundamental freedoms, like the freedom of speech and so forth, why that is so, um, so important, and the value of diversity of thought and how people should respect that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways to do, to do that, I, I argue, is to have compulsory debates in class where students have to debate the opposing view from the one that they actually mm -hmm. hold mm -hmm. so that they're actually familiar with counterpoints mm -hmm. and they actually begin to realize that there is some validity to counter arguments mm -hmm. and also to expose them mm -hmm. to the rough and tumble of mm -hmm. argument because the the snowflake situation we have is because people aren't they've never in their lives been in an argument with with anybody mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's why yeah. they want safe spaces and they arrive mm -hmm. at university so unprepared mm -hmm. what um what, i mean what a lot of people I'm, I'm sure will be thinking when they're watching is well they, they couldn't agree more, but how are you going to get around this problem of left-wing teachers? Well, I have a whole section to devoted right. to, to that <laughs> as well, because as actually this is, this, is, this is the major issue that we have here, is that, of course, the teaching profession have gone through a complete seismic shift in yeah. attitude from perhaps when we all went to school, when there was certainly much more of a conservative streak to our teachers. And the root cause of all of this are the teacher training colleges, mm. as I call them, the woke madrasas. Mm. Um, now, in the old days, teacher training colleges were independent institutions where you would go to and they produced perfectly fine teachers, but they've now been captured by the universities. So mm. they've all ended, essentially, 
and teachers come out of departments of education at universities, which are probably the most woke mm. institutions in the entire university campus. And so in the proposal we have here, you would close down all the departments of education at universities and you would re revive these teacher training colleges, but more importantly, do what the Tories argued in 1992, which is to actually have uh, teacher training schools in the same way that doctors learn in yes. special hospitals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in training hospitals, mm -hmm. you would learn on the job. Therefore, you're, you're never getting indoctrinated by mm -hmm. woke ideology mm -hmm. in, school, in, in school. Also, doing things like we have, there's a uh, the project for soldiers to become teachers when, mm -hmm. they, leave, when mm -hmm. they leave the army. Which is they, a, they come which is in a great idea. and they've got discipline <clears throat> and they've got respect, traditionally tend to be very conservative. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to ensure that, there's, that there are paths and avenues from business as well for people to come into teaching from more conservative backgrounds mm -hmm. and also encouraging parents to get more involved. Mm -hmm. Parents should get onto the board of governors of their schools, mm -hmm. holding the headmaster to account, mm -hmm. holding teachers to account, asking to see, well, they'll have a right under this to actually see all of the teaching materials mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. taught. There's no reason in this day and age why all teaching material shouldn't be on the school's webpage mm -hmm. where any parent can access it. Mm -hmm. And no outside, <clears throat> a ban on outside forces coming in, outside bodies, and where they are used, they can only be from a government supply I list mean, of names. That's going into your area. That's, you? that's essentially what I talk about, isn't it? Well, you, you actually, well, some of your examples, and this is the, broadly speaking, about gender, ideology, and, and critical race theory, mm -hmm. etc., in schools. Some of them are your examples are just hair raising, actually. But you do say this is a very important thing that obviously parents should have access mm. to third party mm. materials, particularly mm. the. Can you yeah. just explain to us a bit about what you've said? Well, what happened in 2020 was that the, the government said um, all pupils need to learn about sex and relationships and health. OK, and that sent everybody into a tailspin and and. Schools just could not provide the material in the short time and the, uh, the vast array of materials that they needed for that. So what happened was these third party providers came in. And as far as sex education is concerned, mm. because that's really what we're talking mm. about here, 200, over 200 completely unregulated providers, third party providers, just coming in and dishing out mm. all of this material, which is frankly hair raising. Can, can I just read my, my yeah. first paragraph? Yeah. Um, because I wasn't even trying to be sensationalist mm. here. This was just the first stuff that I stumbled across. Okay, and it goes like this. I could start with a jaw-dropping example. God knows there are plenty to choose from. I could, for instance, tell you that teachers in Surrey have instructed nine-year-olds to masturbate as part of their weekly homework. Or I could point out that a primary school in Edinburgh held a wear a skirt to school day in which all male pupils and staff were encouraged to take part. How about my mentioning a teaching resource about that champions anal sex mm. to 12 year olds? Mm, mm. Now, the, the, the key issue is that many people know that very kind of awful things are going on in schools. OK, mm. but people just say, oh, well, yes, we know that um, it's it's political correctness gone mad and and somebody else will sort it out. No, other people won't sort it out. We really need to get down to the nitty gritty. We really need to look at the details. Mm. And it's not just the schools. It's these third party providers coming in with all of this material. And there's a very definite conspiracy to keep that quiet to keep that out of the way and they use several arguments one is copyright you know mm -hmm. this is their material we we, we mustn't uh, uh we, we can't afford to show it because it's ours we, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah another one is well it's it's the safety of the children you know it's it's mm -hmm. they they need to they need to look at this uh in private because it's it's their identity and if other people know about it then there'll be you know people can attack them yeah but the re one of the real issues is, of course, that it's all such absolute rubbish, real crap, that people are embarrassed about it as well. And this is one of my uh, interviewees, Claire Page, the brilliant Claire Page, who's campaigning um, against all of this stuff. Uh, secrecy in schools. She says, you know, we need a, a database with all of this stuff on and we just need to get rid of all of these third party providers. But you see, the, yes, so get rid of those, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> But the basis of the 
pledged in our book mm. is that there, there should be a ban on the teaching of this stuff as though it were fact. Mm. So the implication being, I don't know whether you could tell me am I wrong, the implication being that somehow it could be taught as a one of many different views. Is that right? Well, it, it could be. And I think it, it, it definitely should be. Um, because there's, there's a sense that, you know, you have to look at different things and, and, and pupils need to learn how to debate yeah. and they need to, they need to kind of push back on different kinds of arguments. But we're, we're a million miles away from this. I mean, this isn't just, as I said before, this isn't just about sex education in a box and they learn about it on a Tuesday afternoon and that's it. It's threaded through the whole mm. curriculum. It mm. infects every single subject. And, they are essentially the it's it's edi you know equality diversity and inclusion it's in the in the in the plain wrapper of edi yeah, yeah. Uh, and that covers everything from very banal stuff on relationships to bdsm yeah. you know and these and, and these are 10 year olds we're talking are we about. talking in both cases with these we're talking about secondary education aren't we would well, you say I think primary and secondary yeah, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the key thing to remember. I mean, the thing is, as you know, my old catchphrase is, you know, forget you know, well, forget universities because once you're there, there is you're too late. My catchphrase is, if the hair is blue, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> right? You have to go for the primary school and secondary mm. school level. Mm. That's the Aristotle's famous line, you know, mm. show me, give me a boy of the age of seven, and I will show you, show mm. you the man. Yeah. Um, and if we don't get them at those very early ages, then actually, there's the the, the game is already too late. Yes. Yeah. And and just to add, I mean the the examples I give in my chapter, some of, some of which are, are primary school, mm. and some of these external providers, they'll have on their website, for example, uh, an education page, and then on another page, and this is one example I give, they've they've got a, a page where they're selling sex toys, mm, mm, mm. and they're dealing with ten year olds. Mm. I, I don't see why why anyone needs to use third party providers. Mm. Surely mm. the government's able to actually have its own contracts with legitimate mm. suppliers just one two three a handful mm. and because they're getting so much money from the government they won't mind or mm. it'll be part of the contract that their materials are available mm. freely online for anyone to look mm. at and mm. see it's, a, it's not unlike you know the sort of unconscious bias <coughs> training courses in, in in the workplace which we've also got a pledge on that they should uh, you should not have to go to those mm. um what is the this this is a what are the chances, do you think, of what appears to me to be commonsensical mainstream recommendations? What do you think the take-up will be of these? We're going to put these to candidates. And when I say candidates, I'm talking about the Tory party mostly, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. These people who say that they're conservative. Um, I think we've arrived at a situation where these would be considered to be really hard right, don't you think? Mm -hmm. In terms of all the pledges, or yeah. these, these, these two... Well, let's talk pledges. about these two. Yeah, in terms of these two pledges, the, the thing is, I don't think the majority of the population will disagree with these. No, no, the no. majority of the nation are absolutely on side, because, of course, we're talking about their children. Mm. And once you're talking about people's children, this is not some abstract intellectual mm. argument, mm. it's mm. the real life. And they, I'm sure, will be absolutely shocked and horrified to hear that opening paragraph mm. that you've said there. The problem, of course, is that disconnect between mm. the average mm. person and the powers that be. It's the detail thing, isn't it? People mm. have got to engage with the detail. And it's horrible. I mean, I, I wrote that chapter and I told you as I was writing it, I wrote it in anger. I was really mm. angry mm. when I wrote that. And I don't do that normally. I'm an academic researcher. It's about, you know, it's about objectivity. It's yes. about distance. You can't be distant when you're dealing with children and people are imposing sex and sexualized identities onto them. And the point is that the parents don't know. Parents don't know, for example, that, you know, their son is, is being called she at school. You know, they don't know that um, their son is wearing a skirt at school, you know, and, and, and called a different name. Also, the shouldn't forget, well, not that you have, but uh, apart from the gender, there's also the uh, critical race mm. theory stuff, which essentially is teaching kids, white kids, that they have this inherent privilege and that therefore they are also inherently racist. Mm. I mean, there were these examples one's come across of where basically kids are all in the playground mm. and they have to take a step forward if they have this privilege, privilege yeah. you know, if they're white and then the step back. Mm. Mm. This is playing with children. At the same time, the white working class boys are the most underprivileged. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and they're the ones who don't go to university. Yeah. They're the ones who end up homeless. They're the ones who are depressed and they're yeah. the ones who kill yeah. themselves. Yeah. 
I mean, these, uh, I, I wondered, I mean, we're talking about education because this is at the <coughs> root. When people say, oh, well, you know, how are you going to get rid of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Westminster bubble? How are you going to get rid of the blob? How are you going to, to move all this? It all comes down to this, doesn't it, really? Well, I think th these two education pledges, any, any prospective MP who signs up to them, I think is a clear vote winner. Because mm -hmm. I don't see how any yeah, decent yeah. person yeah. would think that this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. The question is whether the, the, the party apparatchiks mm -hmm. would actually be in favour of that. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll also put them to reform, of course, mm -hmm. uh, who are now kind of, you know, going ahead a little mm -hmm. on 11%. Um, but just moving away from education a bit, mm -hmm. there are 10, as I said, um, in immigration, you know, on how to indeed remove this kind of absolute lock grip that uh, the blob have on our institutions. Can you just uh, just observe a few things about them, actually, Ray from Phil? I mean, you know, for me, I have to say that the immigration one is the most important because in order for these things to actually work in the first place, you know, you've got to have a country. And the, the way things are going, actually any kind of recognisable country is actually sort of going fast. But, you know, maybe read a few <coughs> out to us, if you would, Ray. So the first pledge is that there must be a permanent end to mass immigration, uh, and the granting of UK residency and citizenship must be provisional for the first five years, conditional on compliance with criminal law and the passing of an English language test. So mm. essentially, if you come here, for in the, if in those mm. five years you have a criminal record or yeah. you can't speak English to a certain level, then you don't get the right to remain, yeah. which I think is perfectly sensible. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, can, can I pick um, yes. one just at random? Um, all institutions and quangos, including publicly funded broadcasters, which stray from their core purpose by prioritising ideology, must be challenged. Now, yeah. I think that's hugely important. Must be important. challenged and also, I believe, lose their public money. <laughs> and lose their public funding. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Because if we're talking about education, it's just one strand. Yeah, yeah, okay. You've yeah. already mentioned immigration, which is essentially the platform mm. for the whole thing. Mm. But also, media, public funding, um, all, uh, all of those things, are, it, that's the other thing. Children um, being exposed to this stuff mm. everywhere mm. they look. Mm. Mm. I think, um, you know, I think, as I said, education is at the very, very basis of it. Just as a, just tell me, you went to secondary school in London and you in Manchester, mm -hmm. is that right? That's right, yeah. I mean, what was your history teaching like? I know that no one was teaching about gender or race school or theory in those days. Yeah. But well, you, I did my history, you, both here and in Canada. Do you, re, do, you, do you remember, I mean, do you remember yeah, history from... My, my teaching. I pretty much do. I, I, I find that it was done purely chronologically. And it's also by didactic teaching, which yeah. is the yes. whole rotating the dates. Mm. 1066, Battle of Hastings, mm. you know, 1215, Magna Carta, yeah. you know, 1666, Great Fire of London. That's not taught any longer. And when you, when you teach children, you know, as I say, pe children know what it's like to be in a trench yes. in the well, First World War, mm. but they can't name you any World War I yeah. battles. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the point of experiencing life of the common man if you don't know anything about why they were there, what the dates were? I think the, the, the dates give you the skeleton mm. of our history and of our island story. Without that skeleton, everything else just falls apart. I think I think my experience it, it's rubbish. You know, my teaching was appalling. But it was a, was it? It, it was a it was a secondary school in Manchester, and and it was it, it was didactic. And we we just get did get a load of dates, but we got no conceptual. You know, there was nothing um, nothing of any any meaning. Right. We were just given those things. So what we get at the moment. Is, is neither nor. You know, we don't yeah. get any of the framework that people desperately need to just make sense of the chronological order, but we don't get any sense meaning making either. Yeah. The meaning making is just substituted yes. with gender bilge and, and critical race theory and all the rest well, of it. Well, as with most subjects, you know, so much depends on the quality of the teacher you mm. get. Can they ignite your passion, your dead poet mm. society style? Can mm. you get. Mm. I had some very good history teachers, that, but I also had some really boring ones mm. and lame ones too. And another of the problems we have, which is also outlined in the book, is that uh, there are fewer and fewer specialist teachers mm. in secondary school mm. who actually know their stuff. Mm. So a lot of history is being taught by teachers who've only got one year of mm. training mm. covering the very basics of history. Mm. And as a result of that, teach kids are being put off because the teachers don't know the mm. stuff that they're actually teaching. Mm. And they certainly don't have a passion for history. Mm. And therefore, we need to have more specialist teachers who know and love their subject mm. to ignite that interest. Mm. Mm. 
yeah and and again i think i think my um, my passion for history came with cultural history at university mm. uh, and i can't imagine um, that happening on on great scale now, you know. Hopefully, I've 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 uh, motivated people, and I know I have to to do PhDs in in cultural history, but um, I don't think there are many other yes. people doing that kind yes. of work. You yes. know, I think I'm pretty much on my own there. But uh, my uh, professor Kenneth Richards, who, who who taught me, was was the world expert on 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 Shakespeare and in, in, in film and 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 in performance. Um, and Commedia dell'arte and all of that stuff really kind of just just made me fall in love with cultural history. Yes. And, it, and it was his delivery and it was his, um, he was just so charismatic, but it was also his incredible depth of knowledge. Yes, you know? yes. One thing is, I think, that unites all the pleasures in this, in this book, and indeed all the chapters, is, for me anyway, that these things, um, however localised they might be, sound are attacks on our way of life they're mm. attacks on our civilization yeah. i mean we did a wonderful show called the west you might have watched um that's something i'd love to see being shown in all of mm. our mm. Uh, of our schools but mm. in the meantime we have this um just basically i would like to ask you both again we have these i say pledges but um well, another good pledge here is is the well, two very good ones. First is that the concepts and law of hate and harmful speech mm. must be scrapped, mm. but incitement to violence must remain illegal, obviously. But that's important. always been there, isn't and it? When you, but when you see what's happening in yes. Ireland, for yeah. example, yeah. or in Scotland, mm. and indeed in Canada too, mm. you realise that things that we took as sacrosanct, mm. I mean, I would never in a million years think that people could mm. be arrested, put in jail for speech, mm. and yet that's becoming yeah, yeah, a yeah. very clear reality. Not just speech, having a meme on your phone. But, but, but something, which we'll talk about later, but, but something as well, which is, which is also important and very clearly connected to education about the boy scuffing the Koran in Wakefield, mm, if you mm, remember. Mm. Uh, it must be stated unequivocally that there is no blasphemy law in this country mm, because, mm, you know, mm, uh, we're seeing in schools a kind of, oh, well, you're not allowed to say that about a certain religion, whereas mm. you can say anything about mm. another religion. Mm. Exactly. I mean, these things, as you can see, they are a bit like, they are like a manifesto. They're as near as to a manifesto as we can get, you know, as, as a new culture forum. Um, just to make clear, once again, 10 pledges, um, this book is around 10 pledges, they will be put to candidates next year. So as soon as we know uh, when the election is going to be, could be like a year's time, it could be talking about December next year. Um, that's when we will swing into action. But uh, you can get the book before then. Um, really, these gentlemen have done wonderful chapters. We've also got chapters by Emma Webb, by Amy Gallagher, by Harrison Pitt, by uh, Evan Riggs from our manor here. Um, it's available on Amazon, or indeed, if you don't like Amazon, uh, mm. you can get it you know, by contacting us, but um, it will be available on Amazon. Um, State of Emergency, a voice for the silenced majority. Um, please do buy one, won't you? Uh, we're getting to near Christmas, and although it might seem gloomy, it's actually full of hope, so it will make a perfect Christmas gift. Um, Philip, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ray. It's a great book, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And uh, just, uh, just to remind you, this is the third in a trilogy. Mm. We did one called The Long March. We did uh, Fighting Back, which you might have a copy of. This is the third one. OK, so um, we shall see you next time. But thank you very much. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button 
and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.